So, boa noite a todos e a todos. Zum letzten Mal hier zu einer letzten Veranstaltung von der Reihe Lecture and Film Tropical Underground, das brasilianische Cinema Marginal und die Revolution des Kinos. Ich freue mich sehr, dass Sie gekommen sind zu unserer ähm, Abschlussveranstaltung, zumindest diese Reihe hier. Ähm, Genau, Sie wissen schon bestimmt, diese Reihe hat im Oktober 2017 angefangen und äh, wir sind sehr, sehr glücklich, dass äh, für die, die durchgehalten sind und zu äh, alle oder zu den meisten Veranstaltungen gekommen sind, haben Sie bestimmt irgendwas äh, gelernt von diesem sehr speziellen Moment von der Filmproduktion in Brasilien und äh, wir sind... Äh, sehr froh, dass äh, die, ganze, die, die Gäste und die Filme, die wir hier gezeigt haben, auch so eine Resonanz haben, dass diese Reihe nicht nur hier für das lokale Publikum, was natürlich unser erstes Ziel, aber auch, dass das eine breitere ähm, Wirkung oder einen Eindruck, äh, auch in, in Brasilien haben wir schon äh, Rückmeldungen bekommen von Leuten, die sagen, ah, da in Frankfurt passiert was und die Leute sprechen über eine, eine Kinobewegung, die manchmal äh, unterschätzt wird oder nicht so äh, gezeigt wird aus außerhalb Brasilien und deswegen sind wir sehr stolz auf, diese, auf dieses Programm und ähm, auch äh, für den heutigen Abend. Also ich mache immer hier auf dieser Stelle auch Hinweise auf die nächste Veranstaltung von Tropical Underground, das äh, schaffe ich heute leider nicht, aber ich kann schon äh, ganz kurz zu unserer nächsten äh, Lecture- und Filmreihe, weil Sie wissen schon bestimmt, dass äh, diese Kooperation zwischen Filmmuseum und der ähm, Goethe-Universität existiert schon seit ähm, fünf, sechs Jahren, dass wir diese Lecture- und Filmreihe machen, zwei Semester lang ähm, über ein Thema oder über ein Regisseur und äh, wir haben ähm, fest äh, gemacht, dass unsere nächste Lecture- und Filmreihe über Chantal Ackermann, die welche Filmmacherin sein wird. Und wir werden dann hier zwei Semester lang, wie gesagt, über die Erfinderin der Form oder der Formen. Und diese Filmmacherin werden wir dann ganz im Detail analysieren oder erkennen oder wiedererkennen hier im Kino des Filmmuseums. Wir freuen uns sehr. Das Programm wird dann kurz vor Anfang ähm, oder in den nächsten Monaten dann ähm, veröffentlicht werden. Ähm, ab äh, Mitte Oktober wird es dann hier losgehen. Sie werden bestimmt ähm, informiert werden, hashseitig über diese Reihe. Aber ähm, genau, zurück zu Tropical Underground. Ähm, zum heutigen Abend. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass äh, Juan Suarez aus äh, Spanien gekommen ist und mit uns über Tonacci und äh, Bang Bangi und seine Filmproduktion hier zu sprechen. Wir ähm, sind auch sehr froh, diesen Film zeigen zu dürfen. Ähm, wie immer bei dieser Reihe, wir schaffen nicht immer also die den, äh, Standards von ähm, Filmvorführungen, die normalerweise die Gäste von dem Filmmuseum äh, gewöhnt sind. Aber wir freuen uns trotzdem, den Film überhaupt zeigen zu können. Deswegen äh, sage ich das auf dieser Stelle schon, ähm, weil das auch äh, für Menschen ein Punkt ist, wenn der Film kommt. Ähm, genau, und ähm, zum Ablauf des Abends, Sie kennen das schon, wir haben zuerst einen Vortrag jetzt, äh, dann haben wir eine kurze Pause und äh, nach dem Film gibt es noch die Möglichkeit hier, Fragen zu stellen und äh, über den Film und den Vortrag äh, mit Juan Suarez noch ein bisschen zu sprechen. Deswegen lade ich alle ein, hier auch äh, nach dem Film zu bleiben. Und einen kurzen Programmtipp habe ich doch äh, ähm, vom äh, Programm des Filmmuseums und zwar eine kurze Anekdote, dass ähm, wir, Sie werden sehen oder haben schon bestimmt gesehen, dass in einem Film der, ähm, die Figur von Paulo Sergio Pereio manchmal eine Affenmaske trägt und ähm, ich habe in eine, im Internet gelesen, dass diese Maske von einem äh, Werbungsartikel äh, von Planet of the Apes war. Der Film ist äh, zwei Jahre oder so nach Planet of the Apes gedreht worden in Brasilien und ähm, zu einer also großen der Zufall äh, zeigen wir hier im Kino des Filmmuseums Planet of the Apes in Originalfassung nächste Woche, am ähm, 11. und am 13. Juli. Deswegen, wenn Sie jetzt vergleichen wollen, wie die Masken von der Original Planet of the Apes auf 35 mm sehen wollen, dann äh, kommen Sie am 11. oder 13. Juli und äh, werfen Sie einen Blick auf unser Programm zu Science Fiction und das gerade im Juli hier im Kino läuft. Okay, genug äh, von meiner Seite. Ähm, ich freue mich, wie gesagt, sehr ähm, bei diesem Projekt hier gewesen zu sein. Ich bedanke mich sehr bei allen, die äh, durchgehalten sind. Und ja, hoffentlich sehen wir uns bei weiteren Veranstaltungen hier bei der nächsten Lecture- Filmreihe. Und jetzt lade ich äh, Professor Vincenz Rediger, der Juan Suarez hier vorstellen wird. Vielen Dank.
Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, there's a saying in English that you should, rather than with a whimper, you should go out with a bang. And uh, we decided that that was not good enough, so we're going out with a bang bang. Um, this is the final event in a year-long series of uh, events dedicated to Cinema Marginal and its context and the connection between underground cinema and music and anthropology and literature. And uh, it's a bit of an emotional moment for me to be standing here because it's been quite an adventure and um, it, it, uh, yeah, it's, it's a special moment to be reaching the end of that trajectory. So before I introduce Juan Suarez, uh, I just want to thank a few people. Um, it is, of course, a matter of courtesy um, to thank our sponsors. Um, the city of Frankfurt made this whole series of events possible because early on they signaled that they would support us uh, in a very substantial way and allow us to build this series of events, which was designed as a campus uh, event connecting various locations in the city of Frankfurt under one thematic arc, uh, Tropical Underground. Um, I would also like to thank the Marschner Stiftung, which uh, added a substantial amount of funding to the uh, basic budget offered by the city of Frankfurt and the Kulturfonds Rhein-Main, which uh, put on, if you will, the finishing stone on our budget and allowed us to really proceed and do what we wanted to do, namely uh, bring in the best people to talk about these films and talk about uh, the various aspects of this phenomenon um, in the course of this year. Um, I also want to thank uh, Laura Teixeira, the film curator at the museum, who just happens to be very knowledgeable about all of this. Um, a Brazilian-born and Brazilian-trained film scholar who is now a curator here in Frankfurt, and that's one of the lucky circumstances that has contributed to the success of this uh, whole series of events, to have you here and to have you as the person who was um, so well connected in Brazil so as to allow us to get all the films here, which, uh, you know, trust me, was not easy. Um, this is an amazing amount of work. Um, uh, we basically did it the, the wrong way around. Usually when you plan an event like this, you make a list of films and you try to figure out which films are available and then you build the event on top of that. And we just put together a program and then Laura went looking for the films and she found them all. Uh, you have, if, if, if you know what film curating is, you know what an achievement that is. If you don't, trust me, it's amazing. So thank you very much, Laura. Uh, the other person I want to thank is Lily Bush, who was, uh, I think the, the official designation was project assistant but she really made things happen. Um, the entire year she was here, she took care of everything. She did translations. She made sure that everyone was where they should be uh, in the right moment. Uh, she contributed to the discussions. And again, um, uh, it was a lucky coincidence that she is someone who was already familiar with what we were working on. She had uh, done part of her studies in Actually, she learned Portuguese in Mozambique, I think I can say that here. And then she'd studied in Sao Paulo, and she was already familiar with Brazilian modernism and Cinema Marginal and Eduardo Iveres de Castro and anthropology. So um, she was someone who provided a lot of good input throughout the year uh, for this event and, and uh, helped significantly make this a success. So thank you so much, Lydia. And because he's here tonight, I also want to thank Oliver Precht. Uh, when we set out to do this, um, one of the things that we wanted to do is organize a German translation of Oswald de Andrade's um, Anthropophagic Manifesto, uh, which is sort of a foundational text for a lot of Brazilian modernist culture and certainly a, a major frame of reference for uh, Tropicalismo and, and the Cinema Marginal. And so we started to talk to publishers, started talking to publishers and always got them to do it, or almost got them to do it, when we found out that somebody's already done it. Uh, and that turned out to be Oliver Precht, who published uh, a beautiful German translation of the Manifesto uh, with uh, Turian und Kant in Vienna. You can buy it um, in any bookstore for 18 euros, and it's money well spent. Um, but that wasn't all of it. It also turned out that he had 
already done the other book project that we were thinking about, namely uh, we wanted to organize a translation of uh, one of uh, Eduardo Iveros de Castro's main works who'd never been translated into German. He had already done that as well. And uh, the book was published just in time for the start of Tropical Underground. So that was another lucky coincidence that um, helped make this a success. And uh, Oliver has contributed to uh, Tropical Underground in a variety of ways. He um, was there at the Kantorwich lecture. He uh, conducted a dialogue on anthropophagism with Viveros de Castro. Uh, he was at the conference. And I'm very happy that he's here now to celebrate the conclusion of this event with us. So thank you Oliver, for all your input. And now to the bang bang thing. Um, our guest tonight is someone who's wonderfully qualified to introduce us to the work of one of the directors who's already been featured in this program, Andrea Tonacci. Uh, from whom we saw a short film in the program, or actually two short films in the program uh, that uh, uh, Felipe, uh, Leo Felipe uh, curated um, four weeks ago, I think it was, more or less. Um, but Andrea Tonacci is a really interesting figure in the Cinema Marginal context. Uh, somebody who was born in Italy, then moved uh, to Brazil as a child and uh, became one of the more interesting, most interesting figures uh, in that particular movement. Juan Suarez is uniquely qualified to uh, talk to us about Andrea Tonacci and uh, the Cinema Marginal because this is a filmmaker that is sort of at the intersection of all his research interests. Uh, Juan Suarez is a professor of uh, American Studies, American Literature at the University of Murcia in Spain. Um, and uh, his main interests uh, of research are modern literature, uh, independent cinema, experimental cinema, and sound studies. And if you have followed the series closely, you will have noted that one of the most, you know, challenging and interesting aspects of the Cinema Marginal is uh, is the soundtrack of these films and and sound montage. And uh, while Juan is not going to specifically address uh, soundtrack in, that's not going to be the focus of the talk tonight. Uh, he is. Uh, uh, uniquely qualified to talk about this because one of his books is actually um, a book on sound which was published in 2007 called Pop Modernism, Noise and the Reinvention of the Everyday which came out from University of Illinois Press. Apart from that, um, uh, Juan has published a, a seminal study on queer American underground cinema called uh, Bike Boys, Drag Queens and Superstars, which came out from Indiana in 1996, as well as uh, one of the first serious book-length studies of the cinema of Jim Jarmusch, uh, which was published with the University of Illinois Press in 2007. More recently, he has been the editor of uh, a series of publications um, <clears throat> dedicated to the question of space and uh, queer space in particular in literature and in film. Um, one of those volumes is Culture Space, Politics, Blurred Lines, which he published with um, Roman and Littlefield in 2015. In 2015 and another book, uh, another anthology entitled Borders, Networks, Escape Lines, The Spatial Politics of Contemporary Fiction, which was published in 2016, I think. Um, <clears throat> uh, Juan has been a visiting professor at uh, New York University, NYU, uh, most recently at Stanford. Uh, he earned his PhD from Indiana University, and he's been teaching at Murcia for some time now. And uh, we're very, very happy to have you back, I can say, because uh, you contributed four or five years ago to the Warhol series, and we're very happy to have you back here in Frankfurt to introduce Bangi Bangi by Andrea Tonici. Please welcome, together with me, Juan Suarez. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent, for the um, introduction. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. Again, Vincent, uh, Laura Teixeira, and Lily Bush for making me, you know, my for coordinating my my visit and for you know flying, helping in 
uh, helping flying and lodging me to the staff of the uh, of the museum and, inst and the institute with technical for their help with technical matters. I'm extremely happy to be part of this um, cycle of uh, presentations of this series of presentations uh, because of the uniqueness of the idea. I mean, I think this is the most. I mean, I can't be certain about it, but I'm I'm, I'm fairly sh you know certain that this is the most extensive treatment that the cinema marginal uh, brasileño brasileiro has ever had uh, outside of Brazil. So I. I think it's a, it's a really uh, unique occasion. I think you're very lucky that you've been able to follow this series and listen to the different speakers. Um, I, um, um, the uh, primary bibliography on these films is still overwhelmingly in Portuguese, so I think it's a, a really important thing to sort of, you know, show them outside of uh, Brazil and, uh, you know, to get um, other scholars interested and other audiences interested in what is uh, certainly one of the most radical, one of the most interesting, I think, uh, film uh, movements in the, in the second half of the 20th. Uh, century. Um, um, I also find uh, very, you know, totally wonderful, in insightful, and provocative the particular interpretation of the phenomenon of the, the, the cinema marginal uh, indicated by the subtitle of the series, Revolutionen, von Kino und Anthropologie. Uh, which underlines, I think, with great elegance, the documentary ethnographic component of this tradition. It is a component that has not really been dealt with at any length in the main literature on the movement by people like Ismael Xavier, Robert Stam, Fernão Ramos, uh, Jairo Ferreira, and others. Uh, but I think it's a very sort of important uh, issue. And I'd like to start commenting on you know, three implications, I think, of this anthropological component in the, uh, in the marginal cinema. Uh, also because the director that I'm going to be discussing today, uh, who is Andrea Tonacci, uh, moved between fiction and ethnography, while at the beginning of his career he leaned more toward fiction, um, bang a bang, the, the film we're going to be watching tonight, by the way sometimes written with an E at the end, sometimes it's bang bang, sometimes bangy bangy. Um, uh, this is the, 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 the furthest that he ever leaned toward fiction, uh, but after he made this film and spent a little bit of time in exile, then he turned toward uh, documentary and toward the fusion of ethnography and narrative which marks I think his most significant late work so I'd like to just like you know underline three sort of implications of this kind of uh, the anthropological uh, the anthropological ethnographic connection of the of the of the Brazilian marginal cinema one implication is that this movement did not bring about only a revolution in the rhetoric of uh, storytelling uh, of you know uh, uh, telling stories in, in, in film uh, the movement also questioned and revolutionized to a great extent the languages of ethnography and documentary by underlining the constructed quality of all documentaries by uh, you know trying experimental ways of doing ethnography uh, by looking at cultural otherness in in, in, in ways that are uh, you know non-essentializing uh, examples of these are the early films of Artur Omar that have been discussed I think by Ivana Ben earlier in the series, uh, films, you know, this is a, a still from, from uh, Triste Tropico, one of those films from 1974. Uh, these are films that, that I think count as one among the earliest examples of the essay film or what we now call the experimental documentary. The films that Eduardo Coutinho also made in the 60s, sometimes uh, made them, sometimes produced them, uh, produced films by Leon Hilsman, and they also count, I think, as sort of, you know, rather experimental ethnographies, rather other experimental documentaries. Coutinho is best known for a film he made in the 80s called uh, Cabra Marcado para Mujer from 1985, but it was still, you know, a sort of retake on a project that he had started in the 60s. So I think, you know, this uh, connection of the, the, the cinema marginal uh, and ethnography, alternative ways of doing ethnography is very uh, sort of important. A second implication is that the documentary quality of marginal cinema is not exclusive to the films that are explicitly labeled documentaries. I think um, that while most of the titles of the Brazilian marginal cinema are actually uh, fictional films, they are never just fiction. And this is something that uh, people like uh, Fernão Ramos and, and uh, Jairo Ferreira have pointed out, uh, that the, the, these films also are at some level uh, what, what Ramos called uh, kaleidoscopic documentary fictions about the filmmaker's own Universe. I mean, in some ways, they, in some ways, they sort of bear witness. They document, you know, the circumstances, uh, the lives, you know, the, the sort of uh, the, the the desires, you know, the the social life of the people involved in them. Uh, but in addition, I think that these films are, uh, you know, sometimes involuntary, sometimes not so involunt involuntary uh, documentaries. 
uh, of Brazil's unequal, uh, unconflictive modernization. So in some ways, you know, they uh, document, you know, the way the country sort of, you know, was experiencing a, a big second wave of modernization uh, during the 60s. Uh, the settings of these films are, you know, sometimes uh, uh, favelas, the spottily developed out uh, outskirts of large cities, mostly cities like Sao Paulo, sometimes modest apartment buildings, sometimes nondescript modern neighborhoods. Uh, you know, they, they, they show in many ways, you know, a, a Brazil that is being transformed, uh, that is being kind of flooded with foreign, uh, you know, uh, products of the foreign culture industry, uh, you know, a Brazil that is sort of welcoming, uh, you know, the new youth, youth culture. Sometimes this leads to kind of uh, rather sort of grotesque combinations, iconographic combinations. Um, this merger uh, of, you know, local, international, archaic, archaic and modern is precisely, you know, the trademark of what was called the Tropicalia moment of 1960, 67 and 68. So these films are, are actually themselves, in a way, uh, sort of documentaries of a particular moment in, in Brazilian life. And then finally, you know, the third sort of implication, I think, of this kind of ethnographic um, uh, sort of element in the, in, the, in, the, in the movement is that ethnography actually marks a vanishing point in the evolution of a lot of these filmmakers. After the heyday of the movement, which some critics, most critics, uh, uh, said between 1968 and 1973, uh, many, filmmaker, many filmmakers turned to ethnography and documentary uh, um, Rogerio uh, Sganzerla, for example, um, uh, you know, whose uh, Bandido da, da Luz Vermela signaled, you know, the beginning of the movement in 1968. He started veering toward documentary already during his exile in London in the early 70s. In 72, he made a film called Fora do Baralho about his journeys in the Saharan desert. Uh, he later developed an obsessive interest in Orson Welles aboard to the Brazilian project. It's all true. Uh, nem, nem todo é verdade. Not, not All Is True this is one of the titles that he developed uh, as a reflection about Wells' uh, earlier uh, sort of documentary fiction, you know, uh, It's All True. Uh, he, he devoted several films to this project of, of, of Orson Wells. He also, uh, Sganzerla also made documentaries such as uh, one called uh, Ritos Populares Umbanda no Brasil. I mean, the, the popular, you know, Umbanda uh, uh, candomblé traditions were sort of interesting to him. Many other documentaries followed this path, you know, Silvio Lana, uh, um, uh, José Agrippino da Paula, the author of uh, Hitler no Terceiro Mundo, which I think you've seen already, Hitler in the Third World. He moved to uh, uh, Africa in the early 70s and documented also uh, possession rituals, dances. Uh, uh, Eliseo Visconti, you know, who made, you know, Os Monstros de Babalu, which is a very sort of pulpy, fictional, you know, sort of uh, a crazy film, also turns to the documentation of Brazilian festivals and popular rituals. Uh, even Giulio Bresani, who's in many ways, you know, one of the pulpiest, most sort of fiction-oriented of these directors, made, you know, travel footage with Andrea Tonacci of their wanderings across uh, uh, Asia, and he incorporated some ethnographic footage in some of his projects of the uh, mid-70s. Anyway, this shift toward the anthropological mode is especially pronounced in Tonacci because he, uh, after, like I said before, after he returned from exile in the uh, early 70s, he would trade, he would just abandon celluloid for a while and started using video. Uh, and he also sort of quit the pop references of his early work. Uh, and he traded that for the world of indigenous communities. Among his most interesting uh, late works are uh, Conversas no Maranhão, a film made, uh, film a video um, on, uh, you know, native, uh, on, on indigenous uh, communities of the uh, Maranhão uh, about their difficulties in holding on to their to their land and to their culture. Uh, uh, and one of his uh, uh, last films, which is the one that you have here in the image, uh, Serras da Desordem, or Hills of Disorder, was uh, translated, uh, is another uh, indigenous project, which is uh, is sort of fiction, but it's also in many ways um, uh, sort of you know what you might call a fusion of uh, documentary and fiction. And at the same time, it is a reflection about you know what it means to document and what it means to try to capture you know cultural otherness. Uh, however, uh, Tonacci's main contribution to the marginal, uh, to the cinema marginal, uh, is the feature film Bang Bang, or Bangy Bangy, which is the one that we're uh, screening tonight, uh, is going to be the focus of my intervention. And it is it's actually very far from these documentaries, from the, um, from the fictionalized ethnographies. It is, as my title indicates, and I apologize for changing 
the title, you know, which was going to be uh, Cannibal Locomotion, and then suddenly it's something else. Uh, but it's actually the same thing, believe me. Uh, so it is a, it's like my title says, it's a, it's a mixture of uh, pop, uh, pop homage, pop artifact, and an art film. It is a knowing homage to Hollywood genre film, similar in many ways to the to the films that you know, to the early Gancerla films, to the films of Ivan Cardozo, to the films of José Mojica Marins, you know, who's a, a precursor of all these you know uh, slightly younger filmmakers than him. Um, uh, but it's also a, a film that is influenced by contemporary European art cinema, especially by Jean-Luc Godard, and I'll you know, sort of linger on that influence. And that stands also in dialogue with the styles of performance in vogue in the Brazilian experimental theater of the time. And, and I will sort of unwind a lot of this. Um, it was, however, predated by several works that in some cases um, teased the distinction between fiction and documentary, but still sort of leaned toward the fictional. These works were Rogerio's Gancerla document Documentario, is a film from 1966 that Tonacci co-wrote and photographed, uh, and Tonacci's own film that you've seen here in this series, Olio por Olio, or An Eye for an Eye, another film from 1966, which he wrote and directed, but was edited by Gancerla. So the, you know, the beginning they had this very intimate uh, collaboration. Uh, Tonacci, at that time, in the early 60s, also uh, photographed the films of other, uh, uh, other you know, contemporaries, other filmmakers, perhaps you know, less known, uh, like uh, Otoniel Santos Pereira, Silvio Lana, uh, Livio Sintra. Anyway, Olio por Olio, the, the short that you saw in an early uh, uh, screening, and Documentario, a film that he made with Gancerla, and Gancerla is right, standing right there next to the critic uh, Luis Dalmeida Salas. Um, the, 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 both Documentario and uh, Olio for, por Olio were presented for the first time together at the Sociedad Amigos da Cinemateca in Sao Paulo, and they were introduced, these films, by this critic, this venerable, you know, sort of more mature critic that you see there, uh, Francisco Luis Dalmeida Salas. Uh, in retrospect, critic and filmmaker João Ferreira regarded this screening as the first significant contestation to the hegemony of Cinema Novo, uh, this screening that contained these two shorts by Isganzerla and uh, Antonacci and other works uh, demonstrated that important films were being made outside the, the Cinema Novo movement by younger and at the time totally unknown filmmakers or fairly unknown filmmakers. Uh, at this time, Tonacci, who was in his early 20s, was already devoting himself full time to the cinema. He had quit uh, architecture studies in his last year, actually, he didn't graduate, uh, and he was spending all of his time, you know, much to the dismay of his family, of his sort of bourgeois family, uh, in uh, cinema clubs and holding discussions and participating in, you know, very actively in the productions of uh, some of his colleagues. At the time, <coughs> excuse me, he had also been recognized as a little bit of a subversive by the authorities. He uh, moved, uh, you know, he was from, he grew up in, well, uh, was born in Rome, as Vincent mentioned, uh, grew up in Sao Paulo, but he moved uh, shortly to Rio for a while, but he had to move back to Sao Paulo when his house was raided by uh, secret police looking for, uh, you know, sort of seditious propaganda. Uh, his following film uh, was a political satire called Blah Blah Blah, which I think was also screened earlier in the series, uh, was banned and it had no public showings in the country, but still received an award at the fourth uh, Brasilia Film Festival, an award given by the uh, International Catholic Film Office. Okay, so... Um, Taken, to get, taken together, the documentario and Olio por Olio, which I'm going to discuss uh, in a little bit of detail, contain a lot of the ingredients that appear later in Bang Bang. Uh, the first, these two films are portraits of anomic middle class. Uh, let me just show you a fragment of uh, documentario, which is, uh, like I said, as Ganzarla film, but it's also very much imbued by Tonacci's uh, sensibility. I'll just let it play, I'll let it run behind me, and as I speak, that way you have something interesting to look at. Uh, and uh, maybe if you want, you can listen as well. So um, this is Documentario. In this film, uh, I'll also be talking about Olio por Olio. Uh, in this film, two male friends wa wander through the city, through the, one of the cinema districts in Sao Paulo, uh, discussing, you know, talking about their lives, you know, how bored they are, they don't know what to do, uh, what film to watch. One of them is a cinephile, and the other one is a little bit of a, uh, he's not so into film, and he's like constantly objecting to everything, you know, like, oh, I don't like Italian film. Well, I just want to see something in color and with, you know, big sound and blah, blah, blah. Um, 
Uh, Olio por Olio depicts, uh, it's not this one, it's another one, uh, depicts another group of friends uh, for men and a woman in, from similar social extraction. You know, they also look like, you know, um, you know, middle class or upper middle class kids. They meet to cruise uh, through the city in the car of one of them. And they drive around, they talk about, the talk is fairly desultory, it's fairly sort of nothing. You know, they talk about politics a little bit, their life, they smoke, they talk about a little bit of a film, they listen to the radio. Uh, after a while, a friend of theirs, a woman, gets on the car and drives with them, then they stop, the, their girlfriend gets out of the car, goes into the car of some other guy, they follow them, eventually, you know, the girl, uh, the, the car where the girl is stops and then the, the, her, her friends who have been following her uh, stop behind them and they uh, pull out, they get out of the car, they pull out of the car the, you know, the girl's uh, new friend and they, you know, they beat him up. So there's this moment, uh, you know, it starts as a sort of, you know, film about, you know, uh, these young people without much to worry about or much to do and it ends up in this sort of, you know, odd moment of, of violence, you know, and uh, one of the weird things about Olio por Olio, you, some of you have seen it, is that when uh, the, the, the girl's uh, other friends are beating up her whatever boyfriend or whatever it is, uh, you know, one of them is taking pictures. So it's not only a sort of, you know, beating, but this beating is being sort of, I don't know, documented like it's fun or something. Anyway, the two films are stylistically very similar, but they are very different in, in tone and effect. They are captured, as you can see in Documentario, uh, they are captured in high contrast, black and white, with a roving handheld camera, which was Tonacci's actual work, in shots of very, very variable lengths that convey the immediacy of filmed reportage. But they also convey somewhat the free gestural framing of some new wave directors, especially Godard, and of some of the new American uh, filmmakers. And I think that John Cassavetes perhaps stands to mind as one possible influence, although I, 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 I haven't been able to track the fact that uh, you know uh, Cassavetes was actually screened in Brazil. So he, he may Maybe just coincidence, of course. It's just like a handheld camera, um, uh, and you know the stylist. This the stylistic coincidence may not have anything to do with uh, actual influence. Uh, the movement of the characters in both films. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the people in both films are in constant movement. You know, they walk in this case, or they, they ride a car in the other case. Uh, let me just go back to my... Uh, uh, this uh, mobility... Okay, let's see where I was. Okay. Uh, their mobility uh, underlines their, um, you know, their rootlessness. I mean, these are, um, again, you know, kids without anything to do, without anything to really look forward to, except maybe a good movie at the theater. Um, uh, you know, the, but, but the two films are different. The, the, the two, you know, young people in Documentario are kind of sort of, you know, innocent and likable and they seem kind of tender. But the, the, the guys, the young guys in Olio por Olio are a little absurd and slightly sinister. They're a little forbidding. Uh, they look, uh, I mean, they look very clean cut, but they are occasionally rude. Like one of them reads a newspaper and throws it in the middle of the street, um, like in a completely ill-mannered way. Uh, and they prove quite adept at violence in the end. Uh, even if their aggression seems to be motivated by jealousy, because it seems like there's something like that going on, that one of them is jealous of, you know, the girl getting in the car with somebody else. Uh, it is inevitable to read the random violence of Olio por Olio and the disillusionment of the two friends in Documentario, because a lot of the conversation is about being bored and about not really having much to look forward to. Uh, it's inevitable to read their situation against the, 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 the backdrop of the military dictatorship that came to power in Brazil in March 1964. The violence of the young men certainly recalls the violence of the secret police and the death squads that were active at the time, and their aimless and the aimlessness and disenchantment of the friends in Documentario brings to mind the lack of political, the lack of a political project outside the technocratic recipes of the U.S.-backed military government in Brazil at the time. So I'm proposing this kind of reading, this symptomatic reading of these films, because it helps us, it helps us to situate these titles uh, in the historical moment in which they were made and I think it also sort of brings out their you know what I've been calling their documentary value you know the fact that they do tell us something about the contemporary uh, social experience now both things as you could tell present slices of life uh, of you know very different slices of life uh, and 
in a way, they do not only depict the characters that appear in them, but also the, the, the city in which they are uh, filmed. Uh, and especially in Documentario, this is a city in the film, in the fragment that you've seen, is a city that is completely uh, pervaded by mass culture. You know, newspaper stands, uh, posters, you know, music and film magazines, theater fronts covered with uh, film stills. Uh, you know, media images in this Brazil have acquired uh, quite an architectural presence and they seem to dominate living space. This is indeed, you know, what you might call the Brazilian version of what at the time the film was made, Guy Debord was calling in France the spectacle. And Daniel Burstein, the American sociologist, was also calling the pseudo event, that is the replacement of actually lived experience by its signs, by signs, by uh, things that are not lived necessarily, but are images, flat images, except that the that lived experience in this film is the experience of science, which at least here and among the Brazilian intelligentsia at the time were not necessarily seen as an exile from something better or more authentic, but, but more matter-of-factly as new elements in the life world, often problematic, you know, certainly tainted by capitalism, uh, but also full of energy and possibility. Remember, you know, if the, the, the inclusiveness, eh? Now of Caetano Veloso's Alegria Alegria, which is, you know, sort of celebrates, you know, this sort of landscape of mass culture, or Elio Itisica's installation Tropicalia from 1977, which includes a TV set at the very end. I mean, it's a sort of uh, installation that uses lots of sort of, uh, uh, you know, kind of poor materials, if you want, but then at the end there is a television turned on uh, to a dead channel. I mean, nothing is showing, but still, it's like a uh, you know, it's there, it's part of life. Uh, now, the landscape of pop science announces mostly B films and Brazilian commercial titles, but there are also occasionally occasional bows to the modern masters. The two friends, and I don't know if that was in the fragment that you saw, the friends stopped briefly before a poster of Alpha Ville, which was uh, Godard's uh, uh, latest release in Brazil at the time. Um, in Olio por Olio, this invasion of mass culture is less visual than oral, because as they are in the car, the radio is constantly on and they are, uh, you know, they you, you hear, you know, there's the the, the, radio, the the radio provides a diet of the hits of the day by, you know, Nancy Sinatra, the Hollies, the Rolling Stones, and some some Brazilian singers as well, Nara Liao, uh, Eduardo Araujo. Uh, but also there are news bulletins on the Vietnam War, and there is also a sort of, you know, grandiloquent political uh, speech that also interrupts the broadcast. Now, Bang Bang uh, elaborates uh, on many of the motifs or already present in these earlier shots in these earlier shorts. Uh, it's a film where characters are, are, are in constant motion. There is a lot of you know driving around in cars like in Olio por Olio. Um, there is a great deal of fascination with car uh, culture. Uh, and it is also a film that is completely pervaded by mass culture as the or and the, the, the inescapable landscape of experience, except that while in the previous films the mass sign was external to the evolutions of the characters, there's a sort of separation between characters and, and the mass sort of you know uh, sign. Here uh, it is internal to them. Characters in Bang Bang do not live against a colorful pop, uh, against colorful pop cliches, but they live inside them. They inhabit those cliches. These are commercial film, film cliches, B-movie cliches, as announced by the very title. Bang Bang, as you probably know, and sometimes written with an E at the end, is Brazilian slang for Western, for the Western film. However, the film, this particular film, is less a Western than a police thriller, or, to paraphrase Rogerio Gancerla's description of his own film, O Bandido de Luz Vermela, it, is, it could be considered a third world noir. Uh, it could also be called, again adapting Gancerla's terms, as un film soma, eh? a film, an added up film, a film, an amalgamation of motifs from several genres. Uh, the bang bang of the title uh, may allude more to the random shootings that occasionally break out in the film in a very you know, fairly humorous way uh, than to actual Western motifs. The most prominent of the Western gestures is the foray, you know, the sort of escape into the of the characters into a sort of wilderness at the end, except that that escape is uh, by car, is on cars, is not on horseback. 
Uh, noir motifs, however, dominate the film. There is an uncertain, ambiguous hero with an, obscure, with an obscure past. There is a gang of baddies, very bad baddies. There is an enigmatic femme who's more fatalistic than fatal. There are numerous night scenes, there are car chases, and even the period cars that are used in the film by the baddies evoke the golden, the golden era of noir, and they seem out of place in the streets of late 60s Brazil, which are completely dominated by the, by the Fosca, by the Volkswagen Beetle that, as you know, was made in Sao Paulo. Uh, these motifs are given improbably, improbable humorous turns that bring the film closer to comedy. Uh, the hero swings between coolness and hysteria and frequently lapses into absurdity. Like, for example, he has some scenes when he's doing his toilet, you know, he's like uh, cleaning up in the bathroom and he wears this uh, mask, which seems uh, from Planet of the Apes, and now uh, uh, Laura has confirmed that it was from the merchandising from Planet of the Apes, which had been released to great success, you know, the year or a couple of years before this, before Banga Banga started uh, filming. Uh, and he's also wearing sunglasses while shaving. Immediately afterwards, he proceeds to make love to this rather sonambulistic, sonambulistic woman who doesn't, you know, give any response, and that's the you know the slide, the image that you have next to, uh, next to the the the, ma the mask uh, 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 photograph. Um, the, and and as, he, as he does this, he's grunting and he's posing like a chimpanzee. The gang of antagonists are also uh, are, are threatening, but they're also pretty hilarious. There are uh, two part-time transvestites in alternating drag. When one is in drag, the other one isn't. Uh, I mean, um, don't ask me why. Um, uh, one is a delicate drag queen, but the other one is a very uncouth, is a very ill-mannered, you know, sort of, you know, he's a big guy, a thick, and he's always eating and he's always dirty. So he does and make for a very attractive drag queen. Uh, a member of the gang is also a blind man who stumbles all the time. He's always about to fall, but he's always also shooting. And then suddenly there's always, there, there's also, sorry, uh, a sort of disquieting Peter Lorre look-alike that you have here next to the real Peter Lorre, uh, uh, you know, who appears for a couple of sequences. And he's sort of a magician. Whenever he snaps his fingers, you know, he the, the, the shot changes. So there's an odd kind of connection between his uh, diegetic, you know, actions and the sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of organization of the film, the montage of the film. Um, the evolutions of the of the blind man are, in particular, recall uh, the physical, the, the risky physicality of silent comedy. And the blind man is the one in the center with the big sunglasses. Uh, there is actually a suggestion of Buster Keaton in his very well-timed awkwardness. Uh, and he's constantly doing very risky things that you know you think is going to fall off a car or fall out of an elevator. Uh, there are, in addition, in the film, uh, hints of sexploitation in the awkward sex scene between the protagonists in an ape mask and his, you know, sort of sleepy, I guess, partner. Uh, and there are also subtle suggestions of a different kind of sexploitation. There are suggestions of homosexuality between the blind man, the one in the center of the image, and uh, the thicker transvestite, the thicker tranny, who's the one eating a banana there with a very dirty face. Uh, there is a, so you will see a couple of scenes where, you know, they, uh, have, been, they, they have been uh, sort of sleeping in the back of a car, of the car, or in the back seat of the car, and both of them sort of rise from there and they seem to be like zipping up their pants as if they had been sleeping together with their pants off and then there's also a scene toward the end where they lie on the grass and you know the the this thicker you know fellow over here is sort of lying down like sort of passed out and the blind man has uh, his arm tenderly on his back so uh, now there are similar suggestions of sexual heterodoxy in other uh, films and I think uh, was it Denison uh, da Laura Denison talked about sexuality Stephanie Dennison, sorry, yes, uh, talked about you know sexual heterodoxy in uh, other uh, marginal cinema productions, but you know that you know there are occasionally gay characters and drag queens and um, anyway, uh, sort of you know what could be understood as sort of queer moments. Uh, not many, but there are some. Now these pop motifs are reworked with an experimental intention, and part of the experimentalism of the film is, for example, in the obscurity of the plot. Uh, the scenes succeed each other without any sense of 
causality or narrative logic. You know, the film is ex is 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 the, the 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 bang bang is filmed in extremely long shots. Sometimes they are you know really virtuoso uh, sequence shots. Uh, but these individual and these individual sequences are perfectly self-contained formally, but they do not cohere into a story. As you put them together, they are sort of you know very disjointed. Uh, the film actually seems more a collection of fragments than a story proper. And in fact, critic uh, Inacio Araujo has stated that rather than as a feature, the film was conceived as a series of tales on the, protag on the, on the protagonist, interpreted by uh, Paulo Cesar Pereiro, who's uh, right in the middle against the back of the elevator, uh, um, a significant actor in this early moment of uh, uh, cinema marginal. Um, just like the storyline, the chronology of the film is also uncertain, and I will not say much about it because you're going to watch it, and you know we can discuss this afterwards. But it seems to me that there's, uh, you know, the sequence, the film could be read as you are seeing it. You know, the sequence, the, you, you could imagine that you are being given a chronological sort of, you know kind of statement of the story, but there are some scenes that could be read backwards or forwards. I mean, some scenes could have happened before you see them, you know, in other words, the order of presentation may not be the order in which things have uh, actually taken place. And there are some fragments of the film that seem completely out of the storyline altogether. There is, for example, an extended flamenco dance performed by the female protagonist, by the woman that the ape man sleeps with uh, in, on the top of a roof of, of, of uh, uh, this dance takes place on the rooftop of a skyscraper, and you see the uh, the sort of uh, the horizon, the skyline of the city be behind her. And this seems to take place sort of you know uh, out of sequence completely. I mean, it doesn't even seem to belong to the world of the story. It's something completely self-enclosed and doesn't connect with anything. Uh, and there are also some uh, landscape shots that introduce the very last part of the film that again seem to be uh, outside the kind of movement of the story. Um, uh, in this temporal distension and vagueness, you know, various motifs are repeated with dreamlike insistence. And some critics have pointed out that the film does have the quality of a, of, of a nightmare, where elements sort of seem to come back. Yeah? And, and you know, there's no reason why. Uh, you know, the, uh, for example, the protagonist, uh, 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 Pereyo, sings several times the same song. He sings awful. Uh, Lamartine Babo's song, Eu Sonhei Que Tu Estavas Tao Linda, is a, is a sentimental song from the uh, 40s. I guess by Lamartine Babo, who's uh, I don't know if he's remembered anymore in Brazil as a singer. No. Um, yeah, he also invariably drives uh, a, a jeep. I do know these uh, all-terrain vehicles, American vehicles. Uh, wherever he is, he finds a jeep. It's always the same jeep. It could be the middle of the countryside. It could be the middle of the city. Uh, the, uh, he wears a monkey uh, monkey mask, but the monkey mask reappears later in the handbag of you know the sort of thicker transvestite here. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there's uh, at some point there's uh, somebody reading a newspaper and on the front of the newspaper there is a headline uh, about, you know, reporting another assault of the disguised monkey man. So is Pereyo the monkey man? I mean, the mask, you know, appears in his face, in a handbag, then there's an allusion to it on a, on a, on a newspaper. Uh, and and n n none of this connects in any way. Um, um, repetition is also uh, present in the actions of the characters. You know, the blind man is constantly shooting for no apparent reason, uh, and this thicker transvestite is compulsively eating. You know, he's always you know pulling bananas and sandwiches and you know whatever you know anything out of his uh, handbag and eating it. Now, um, the experimentalism of the film is also evident in its influences. It contains several allusions to art cinema, and I will concentrate on the allusions to uh, Jean Luc Godard, who is the dominant influence, and more briefly I'll mention, you know, connections also to other uh, contemporary uh, 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 marginal filmmakers, uh, to Silvio Lana, A Sagrada Familia, The Sacred Family, and to another film, uh, Juanjo Nasceu, the Giulio Bresane, uh, the angel uh, uh, was born. So uh, now Bang Bang's constant resort to cars and the catastrophic driving which is tied to aggressiveness, failure, and malfunction, recalls uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Weekend. Weekend also contains constant motion. It is structured as a journey. It has a, it has a, a very desultory plot. It has a very disjointed plot, uh, although it is much more intelligible and much more cohesive than the one in Bang Bang. Um, it is also punctu uh, punctuated by humorous shootouts. Uh, in Godard, cars and driving, however, are metaphors for bourgeois consumerism and greed uh, and class domination. In Tonacci, 
mostly I think that the driving and the cars are emptier signs. They are certainly genre markers. Right? They mark the sort of noir genre. They allude to the policier, to the you know police thriller, uh, and they do have an iconographic rather than a symbolic function. I think in Godard, the journey of the bourgeois couple entails a progressive degradation. I mean, they start out as this well-mannered kind of cute little couple, very fashionable, but as the journey goes on, they sort of, you know, they lose their markers of class, they lose their privileges, and they end up, uh, you know, without a car, you know, walking, uh, and being immersed in the, same, in the same social world that they despise, the world of peasants, the world of vagrants, low-wage earners, and the film uh, finally ends with a couple, you know, with a coupling uh, weekend, uh, uh, ab absorbed by a cannibalistic gorilla cell that eats the husband and then incorporates the wife as one more gorilla, one more member of the group. Now, the protagonists of Bang Bang, however, do not move vertically. They don't move up or down the social scale, but they move sort of horizontally on the margins. Uh, to side with just one more parallel, Godard's film presented itself in one of the cards as a film retrieved from a junk heap, yeah, from, a, from, a, from a pile of, of like odds and ends, and of metallic spare parts. Uh, and the credit sequence of Tonacci's film actually takes place in a junkyard as well, yeah, in a place where there are car spare parts. So I think this is also possibly a direct uh, sort of allusion. Other Godardian gestures are the framing and the soundtrack, like Weekend, Bang Bang, and falls in constant lateral and perpendicular traveling shots. I mean, again, it's a very kinetic film. Uh, the traveling shots are frequently, you know, in the car chases, you know, the camera is frequently mounted on cars. Uh, traveling shots are all, traveling shots and pans are also sometimes pendular. That is, they move back and forth over the scene in a way that was uh, first practiced by Godard, I think, in Vivre sa vie, uh, to her life to live from 1962, in one of the multiple sort of cafeteria scenes when two characters are talking and the camera, you know, sort of moves kind of as a pendulum, you know. Um, sometimes you see almost the two faces, other times you only see the, na the, the back of, you know, the guy's, uh, you know, head, be and, 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 you know, because the, the camera has uh, been positioned in such a way as to sort of, you know, only show that. Uh, now, Tonacci also picks up on this movement, and he repeats it in, uh, in one scene that also takes place at a cafeteria. And it's actually a scene that, you know, is sort of Godardian in a way, two characters speaking at a cafeteria, uh, having a sort of, you know, slightly, again, absurd uh, conversation. Um, the soundtrack is also very reminiscent, I think. It's very, also very Godardian in a way. It is saturated, it is noisy, with ambient sound, and music frequently drowning the character's speech. Sometimes you can hardly hear the characters because of the music music and the, and the sort of ambient sound, and this is deliberate. But unlike Godard's films, whose music was for the most part especially commissioned, in Bang a Bang and in most marginal films, the music is a collage of a vast variety of styles, uh, from various kinds of rock to Brazilian popular music to ethnic recordings to jazz. The use of, the, of music is often what Michel Quillon called an empathetic. That is, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't match the effect of of the images. It contradicts sometimes directly the effect of the images. That is, you know, uh, uh, an, 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 a scene where nothing happens has a very dramatic uh, music, and a, a dramatic scene has very relaxing music. Uh, so the music and the image often work uh, uh, against each other. Um, there are um, uh, Bang Bang also stands close to films in its immediate orbit, uh, to other, you know, marginal films. And for example, the plot and the characters echo those of Bresanes uh, Oanjo Nasheu. It's another film about criminals. This time it's only two criminals on the rampage, uh, haunted by the imminence of an angelic announcement. Like the members of Bang Bang, they break and enter, they assault and torture people, uh, although they are a little more savage, really. They are both more ordinary, more believable, and much more savage than the characters, than the bad people in Bang Bang. Um, uh, and they also move in by car. I mean, they're sort of stealing cars and using cars to uh, sort of, you know, move around. But Bang Bang is closest, actually, to Silvio Lana's A Sagrada Familia, is another of the, is not one of the best known uh, among the sort of, you know, uh, the, the, the marginal uh, uh, films. Um, both Bang Bang and A Sagrada Familia uh, were made simultaneously with a nearly identical cast and crew in Beo Horizonte, in Minas Gerais. Um, uh, 
a fact that is interesting to take into account because it sort of expands a little bit the geography of the marginal cinema. You know, it's not just Sao Paulo and uh, and, uh, and and Rio, but it's also you know there's also a little bit in uh, uh, Minas Gerais. You know, Neville Almeida was from there. Geraldo Veloso, who did the sound for many of these films, uh, was also from there. Um, um, there's so, of course also marginal productions in uh, uh, Salvador, uh, in Bahia. You know, as you, you know, so you saw Meteorango Kid, right, which was made uh, uh, in a different location. Anyway, the, the, both a Sagrada Familia and Bang Bang were made uh, by the same production company that was created by uh, Silvio Lana, by the director of this film, and by Tonacci to finance their projects, and they tossed a coin and they said, okay, we have money, so which film is going to uh, be produced first? And it turned out to be this one. So they made this one and then right away they made a bang a bang, but sometimes in the same locations. Uh, and like I said before, with a, you know very much the same crew. Now, a Sagrada Familia is similar to Bang Bang also in topic, in you know story. Uh, it's actually a film that follows uh, Godard's weekend more closely than Bang Bang because it's about a, a, a bourgeois family who go out into the countryside on a little excursion. Uh, but the journey never seems to stop. And they sort of, you know, as the more they travel and they f the further they get into nature, the more they seem to degenerate, the more they sort of scream at each other and they become violent and they become, you know, sort of unstructured and they sort of, you know, kind of dissolve as a family. They end up sort of you know, becoming a little bit barbaric and losing all sort of civilized uh, manners. Uh, the soundtrack, like that of Bang Bang and of many other marginal films, is quite experimental and stands in a very oblique relation to the visuals. And this is, again, something that is a bit of a motif, as we were sort of talking before, uh, you know, walking here, walking into the room. Okay, so I move into the... Uh, I have a few more things to say, not many. Um, let me move into the last part. Uh, which is about, uh, um, you know, just general comments about the sort of uh, aesthetics of uh, marginal cinema, how Bang Bang is part of that aesthetic. Oops, Oops sorry. Now this amalgam of um, quotations and references and connections with other films uh, certainly um, underlines, you know, with the anthropophagic nature of Brazilian marginal cinema, you know, the fact that it's a cinema uh, frequently about the cinema. It's a, a kind of uh, filmmaking that frequently takes other films as its uh, subject matter. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of filmmaking that is based on what uh, Jairo Ferreira, uh, whom, you know, who was also a filmmaker himself and whom I sort of cited before, uh, he said this is a tradition, this is a, a, a type of cinema that is based on what he called tradizão, uh, traduzão, translucifração, which is sort of oddly cut off there at the end, sorry. So tradition, translation, and transluciferation, the luciferation is, has something to do with the light and that I will not go into the... Uh, but anyway, it is a, it's, it, these are films that are, uh, again, extremely referential. And again, you know, one of the main references is, uh, you know, what Sganserla called the, the last 50 years of bad cinema. Sganserla said, you know, we're taking the last 50 years of bad cinema and turning them around and producing something that, produ that, 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 that results in the immediate negation of the apparatus of mass culture. That is, you know, this is, these films offer frequently a critical version of the cliche of mass culture, and this critical version might lead to a different form of consuming film and mass culture, and perhaps indirectly to a different way of being in society and understanding the world. Uh, in any case, what films like Bang Bang presented was repetition with a difference, you know, a critical difference that, as it paid homage to the vitality of pop artifacts, also recommended their revision and undoing their creative elaboration. Now, this uh, re-elaboration of mass culture takes place in the marginal cinema, I think, in two different ways. In two different ways. One of them is inflationary, by sort of exaggerating the style of uh, mass culture, uh, and another way is deflating that style, that is, uh, letting pop cliches, letting mass cultural cliches, you know, cinematic cliches, run on and on and on till they unwind, distend, expand in time in such a way that they become just 
iconographic markers of the popular, but emptied out of narrative direction and symbolism. It seems to me that this is the road taken by Sganzerla and Bresane in the films that they made for Bel Air Productions in 1970. Now, Bang Bang stands halfway between those two modes, I think. It is still a recognizable narrative, even if it's very opaque. Uh, it, it does have an inflationary quality because it does exaggerate many of the traits of <coughs> excuse me, film noir um, and of other, you know, of sexploitation, of other popular styles. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a lot of narrative distension. There is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, letting those uh, sort of gestures and styles unwind and dissolve and fray, you know, and sort of kind of, uh, you know, become uh, an endless kind of, you know, statement that doesn't lead uh, anywhere. Uh, now, the combination of deflation, and, and, and in addition, this deflation is infused by a very emphatic, overheated emotionalism. I mean, there's often anxiety, hysteria, violence, disgust, uh, that seems to come from nowhere, because again, the story doesn't bear this out. The stories are kind of uh, disjointed and don't, don't seem to justify these extremities of feeling. Uh, and these, these kinds of effects revolve upon themselves, searching but not finding a release. Now, the combination of narrative deflation and emotionalism results in a sort of nauseating assertion of corporeality, an insistence on the presence of the performers as bodies, eh, as sort of bodily presences. It is never a comfortable presence. I mean, bodies in these films, and especially in Tonacci's Bang Bang, you will see, are often trapped, compressed, pushed, full of awkwardness and impediment. They stumble on each other, they rub against each other and against the things of the world in ways that are painful to watch. Uh, this is a discomfort that is enhanced by the lengthy exposure, and you will see many of those moments in uh, Bang Bang. Now, this insistence is tied to a difficulty in verbalizing. Uh, Fernando Ramos has pointed out this trait in marginal film. Characters speak platitudes, they speak like formula, they say things that don't really mean anything, um, or sometimes communication is obstructed and circuitous, misunderstanding is frequent, sometimes gesticulating and screaming end up replacing words, uh, and such nonverbalism often finds a prolongation in a disturbed orality, in disorderly eating, or its inverse, vomiting and, spe and spitting. These are films, the, the, the marginal cinema is very oral, but it is a sort of purgative, negative orality. It is an orality not so much that interjects, that nurtures, but that ex expels, that spits things out. Even singing sometimes has this quality. I mean, there's uh, a lot of singing in uh, many of these films. I mean, for example, uh, you know, Se uh, 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 it seems to me, by Zganserla, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is sort of put together as a series of musical moments. But these musical moments do not function as the musical moments in the classical film, which are moments of unity, of connection. They are moments, rather, of disunity, of disintegration. Uh, in many ways, marginal cinema, with this kind of mistrust of verbal language, is an Artodian cinema. In some ways, this cinema extends the considerable influence that Antonin Artaud had on the Brazilian avant-garde, at least since Augusto and Haroldo de Campos and Desio Pignatari uh, championed him as one of the inspirations for their group Noi Gandres in 1952. In accordance with some of Artaud's proposals for the theater, in the cinema marginal, gesture, presence, and voice bypass communicative language. So rather than communication, the referential function in the classic distinction by Roman Jacobson with the functions of language, it is the fatic function that predominates, the one in which language does not affirm or represent anything except the co-presence of the speakers to one another. What is transferred in linguistic or paralinguistic exchange is affect and intensity. And this, it seems to me, is something that comes from the experimental theater tradition of the time, which influenced these films a lot, and I think is uh, one of the sort of understudied elements, I think, in this uh, tradition. Uh, uh, the discomfort and the difficulty in communication, this Artodian transfer of intensity rather than transfer of meaning, do not necessarily make for comfortable watching. There is a degree of aggressiveness toward the viewer. The disconnection and awkwardness inside the films were easily replicated around the films. Perhaps it couldn't be otherwise in a sharply divided society, large parts of which had supported the coup, the military coup, and continued to support it, and some 
parts of the society were not entirely against the repression of the unions, the left, or the peasant organiza organizations, all in the name of some idea of progress. In this context, unity, whether it was textual unity, or some purported sense of connectedness with the audience could only be illusory and spurious. Critic, Brazilian critic Roberto Schwartz claimed in relation with the experimental theater of the time, which like the films, which like the films was often revulsive and difficult, that they, there could be no peace with the public. That is, there could be no peace between the art world and the public because any kind of sense of connectedness was a lie, you know, it really didn't really work, it didn't really happen. Now, I finish now. Uh, it may not be surprising then to retake my opening comments on the ethnography and the documentary quality of the uh, cinema marginal, that filmmakers like Tonacci ended up transitioning from deranged, from these crazy homages to mass culture and from fictions populated by outcasts to another type of marginality, that of Brazilian indigenous cultures and communities. Like the outcasts in his films, <laughs> Unlike the despised products of the culture industry that he sought to revaluate and explore, the native communities, the indigenous communities, stood against the cultural, economic, and social normality that threatened to engulf them. In these communities, Tonacci found again popular agency, outsideness, resistance, nonconformity. These were once the qualities of a sector of youth to which he belonged and whose sensibility he captured in his early films. Later in his life, he found these qualities again in indigenous communities struggling for survival. Only in this case, the balance of forces is more unequal than in the films of his youth and the outcome of the struggle is more uncertain, or rather, sadly, it is too certainly bad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan, uh, for this amazing introduction to the film, and at the same time, some sort of uh, um, um, revision of the other films we have seen here. So I thought it was a, a great uh, talk to, to finish the series. Thank you very much. We're going to have yet now a, a 10 minute break. Uh, the bar is still open. I talked to them and it really should be open this time. And uh, we'll start with the film in about uh, yeah 10 minutes or something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, John, let's hit it right away. Yes, please. Um, when we were walking over, you invited me to think a little bit about what was going on in the soundtrack. And so I did. Um, but I just, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the interplay in the film between what film scholars called the diegetic and the extra diegetic sound. Um, and I'm thinking especially of the title sequence because it's there that there's a kind of fusion. He shoots the gun and the title, bang, comes. Um, so that you get this kind of strange traveling between what's happening in the world of the fiction and then what's happening in the world of the film, right, in terms of that space outside of the story, which is nevertheless accompanying the story. This happens a lot in this film, and there's a sort of strange way in which he keeps playing with which space we're in. And I thought a lot about this in relation to that flamenco sequence, because the flamenco is a dance that is danced in order to make the space where the heels are clicking on the floor part of whatever music has been brought to that space. Um, and that sequence is clearly one where she's dancing against a still image on a floor that looks like the bottom of the frame throughout as though somehow this is not about the story, as you say, but it's about the medium and about where the sound and the space are playing themselves out. 
So anyways, it's just struck me that this is a hugely important piece of this film. So anything you want to say, <laughs> I would uh, I'd be fascinated. So thanks. No, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. No, thank you. I think, um, I mean, I, I say yes to everything you've said. It's, uh, you're totally right. I mean, there's a lot of interplay between diegetic and non. I think part of it has to do with what I called in the lecture the inflation of style, making style so evident and so overwhelmingly like comic book style you know that it hits you in the face i mean the convention is lo no longer something that you uh consume sort of passively but it just sort of strikes you in the eye like in the title sequence you know the bang and then the title the the letters you know the lettering kind of jumping at you uh yeah uh there's also a lot of uh, deflation of conventions when the sound doesn't accompany necessarily the you know there's this scene when uh, uh paulo cesar Pereira is climbing uh, climbing climbing down a building in the facade of a building and there's si absolute silence where you would expect you know a dramatic sort of you know tense kind of soundtrack um a lot of the times the film is making you aware i mean as if you could ever forget it it's like this is a film so i'm you know i'm constantly playing the music and the sound to make you aware that this is a construction uh so i think this is another thing that takes place all the time uh, there's also the activation of uh, the sort of off-screen space and not diegetic space that comes ends up kind of like at the very end you know those those like the howling laughter you know uh, that is non-diegetic but it's also off-screen so it's uh, taking place at the time of the filming the flamenco sequence yeah I mean, I, I totally agree. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, one of the things that strikes me about that sequence is that it's slightly desynchronized. I mean, the music. So she doesn't. Cl she seems professional to me, but she's not producing those sounds. So I think it's a uh, it's a slightly mismatched uh, sort of uh, accompaniment, and I think it's deliberate. Um, so to me, a lot of this is about either sort of enhancing the style and making the convention the convention super evident, or about deflating it and. Uh, sort of diluting it and deconstructing it, if you, if I can use that very old word. word. Mm -hmm. So, but maybe to to latch on to what uh, John uh, just said. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm so glad we programmed this film at the end of of, of the series because it's such a profoundly cinematic uh, film. It's very much about how much cinema you can get out of almost nothing, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and and John was already getting there when he said, you know, it's about it's about the medium. And I I think the the um, the the what one of the signature scenes, of course, is the one with the with the Peter Lorre lookalike, who's introduced as a magician, you know, with the with the white dove and and the cards and everything. And and then it's the he does the finger snipping. So and and the finger snipping always, uh, you know. Is, is of, of course a magic trick because people appear or disappear, but it's also he also marks the cut, so it's 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 sort of a, um, a an acoustic uh, marking of 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 the editorial process or of montage, uh, and yeah, I wonder if you could comment on that on the the finger snipping. <laughs> Sure. I mean, I think, again, it's about making the convention evident this time. You know, exactly what you said, you know, marking orally, marking acoustically the, 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 the shot change. Uh, it, it also seems to do other things that we do not see when Pereyo is in the bathroom. You know, they yell, food. And then when he comes out, there's like more food on the floor and plates. And somebody says, uh, musica, you know, music. And then there's the jukebox that wasn't there before. So it seems that, you know, in addition to like marking the shot changes and the cuts, uh, I don't know, he, gen you know, generates this uh, reality out of nothing, which is exactly what film is about, is creating these spaces and these locations out of, you know, juxtaposed shots. But the reality doesn't necessarily exist there. Um, um, I think there's also a sort of enjoyment of sound as sound. I mean, of course, the the snipping is like uh, okay, you can you could see it as the as the clapboard that you know that marks the beginning of the shot and it's used to synchronize. Uh, but there's a lot of enjoyment in sound itself. It seems to me like there's a lot of enjoyment in music, per se, in, in movement itself as something that is like fun to watch. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, maybe you could describe it as the fun of taking the narrative value out of dramatic music. You know, purging it of whatever drama, you know, dramaturgical function it 
may have had Johnny. I, I was just going to throw one more thing. Um, the other place that the snipping is very conspicuous is in the flamenco. And, and there it's supposed to be, it, it's supposed to have a status within the dance of punctuating, you know, articulating one move and another. But it, as you say, it's not synchronized. So that there's a very funny way in which its, it's task is frustrating. Even when it's being used not as magicians, but as part of a performance that is, you know, all taking place in one, one shot, essentially. So there's some kind of displacement of its function, even as it's being put before us as a function. We watch it go awry, sort of thing. Yes, Sonia, please. Yeah, if I may add something to that, it seemed to me, I, I would totally agree, and it seemed to me that the film really is, uh, the film sound is constructed on this clash between, on one hand, uh, this playful way to play with film music conventions and on the other on these disturbing noises and sounds that uh, come over like there is um, like also like a, a, a his sound and uh, this sound of uh, it seemed to me the sound of a magnetic tape um, uh, rewinding uh, so it's kind of uh, really um, yeah constructing uh, our exper sound experience between these two poles. On one hand, uh, the f uh, like film music in its different genres, genres as well. Uh, so it's playing uh, in different scenes between um, film music conventions and uh, putting together music that uh, pertain to different genres, but also like. Uh, using a lot these disturbing noises and um, this use of disturbing noises um, uh, it's present also in, in uh, other films um, in the uh, to, yeah, of the uh, cinema marginal uh, but I found this combination between this, these two elements very very interesting and totally fascinating also as an experience I mean it I really think in these examples, like the film is really constructed on sound and images come later, like or like uh, as a, an accompaniment to sound. Uh, yeah, that's if, a, if you have some. That's, that's a wonderful idea. That's a wonderful idea. I never thought of that. I mean, certainly sound has the last image, which is paradoxical when you have the vari yeah. variable area is the last thing you yeah. see, you know, kind of oscillating on the screen in the black. Uh, yeah. No, I think that, yeah, the use of noise and the use of electronic sound and uh, it is a constant in cinema marginal. Um, I think, I mean, there are many different ways to interpret it. And of course, every film has a different way of playing with it. Uh, I mean, to me, there's constantly in these films stuff that sticks out that you know the, these films do not allow you to sort of walk home with a with a pill with a sort of self-enclosed well kind of tied up thing you know rib uh, you know it's not a film that you can tie into a ribbon and sort of take it with you uh, these are films that i think that there are many things that stick out and are uncomfortable and they don't quite gel and i think it does i mean uh, sorry to sound sort of Adorni, Theodor Adorno like in Frankfurt, but, but I think there is a, a, a sort of negative dialectic. I mean, there's an emphasis on not co cohering because it wasn't, because cohering was in a way, it's a lie. I mean, we're, it's not a cohesive society. It's a very dramatic situation. I mean, to me, it's inevitable to read it against this background of dissent and uh, persecution of a, a sharply divided society that was very dramatically, you know, suffering under, you know, these juxtaposed ide ideologies, you know, the more liberationist one and this the sort of oppressive military government. So I think in a way is what uh, Roberto Schwartz said, you know, any sort of sense of peace within the text or with the public is untenable, should not be there because we were kind of fooling ourselves. Right. Maybe that's the reason why the Catholic uh, Critics Association gave him a prize. <laughs> and, <laughs> the ne um, negative dialectics to it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I just I'm, I'm always stunned with with Donacci. He's he's in, in, he's a, a a satirist 
but it really happens at a formal level so it's it's never it's never obvious and i mean this film doesn't have any dialogue to speak of for instance uh but but it's still there is something profoundly satirical about it we have a question at the back Um, I just wanted to come back to the question of the magician once again, because I think his role is very fascinating and very interesting. Um, we've already mentioned um, the the character of his magic being kind of a cinematic power as well. So um, I think he's a very interesting figure if we relate him to, to the figure of the filmmaker as well. Um, so filmmaking becomes something powerful and magic in this scene, um, and it's very entertaining and it's funny. But in the next scene, he's in this elevator, he's in this enclosed space, and he pulls out a gun. So I think this is also something we could uh, think about when we talk about the film as well, because the film is funny, the film is uh, grotesque, it's kind of burlesque, but at the same time, it's very challenging and it's very disturbing. So um, I think maybe it's something we could also say about cinema marginal in general, or about um, the understanding of cinema and of filmmaking that is often depicted in the cinema marginal. And I was wondering... Um, that would make sense to you or if you could say something about that and about the role of the magician in this in this context in this sense no i think that i mean it's, it's a wonderful statement you know the duality i think between magic i mean creating and generating something sort of um, dazzling and uh, fantastic in the sense of fantasy like and at the same time having a sort of uh, a disturbing element having a sort of cutting sort of potentially dangerous element with a gun and, and he's genuinely threatening I think in the elevator when you know are you police no does that work yeah so th th you almost expect him to like you know shoot uh, Pereyo you know the character so I think it is it, it really defines a lot of these films you know the sort of mixture of sort of cinematic enjoyment and a certain cinematic magic with you know a deep level of um, awareness of the sort of terrors that kind of were happening around, you know, in this society. This is something that Fernando Ramos, you know, the great critic who was here in February, uh, ha in his book, um, um, uh, uh, Cinema Marginal, I think it's called, uh, uh, Representação am seu limite, I think it's called. The, the, he does bring up uh, the duality. It's, a, it's slightly different. He says there is a tension in these films between uh, courtisan, uh, the enjoyment, and uh, this bond, uh, you know, just like hedonistic fun and terror. I mean, the, and the two are kind of connected. But it's, a, it's sort of a version of what you're saying because you're talking about a certain magic at the same time uh, happening alongside a certain sort of violence. And yeah, I think the gun also on guns, you know, there's this uh, famous saying by Godard, you know, a film is a girl on a gun. And here is like, you know. Which is also what is happening in the flamenco scene, no? Because yes, there again, we have the entertainment, we have the girl, we have the woman, yeah, yeah. and we have the shooting at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. a girl on a gun, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I was just going to come to that. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's the basic elements of cinema: girl going in a car. Um, uh, but for large stretches of the film, the girl is a crossdresser. I mean, there's the flamenco dancer, and there's the hoy, uh, the hoy girl, who later rides the jeep with with the protagonist. But the most prominent female figure is. A crossdresser. Can you comment on that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it's once more this way of satirizing conventions. I mean, you can have a, a gang of, uh, you know, you, you can have gangsters, but having them cross dress is like a further twist, you know. Uh, I think it's wonderfully disruptive, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's really part of this anarchic kind of way of living in the body and mm. habiting bodies that exists in a lot of these uh, films. So I would just align it with that sort of element in Cinema Marginal, the, the kind of anarchism, this sensorial sort of, you know, anything goes. Mm. Know, I mean, uh, there's, there's this famous um, Monty Python sketch about the, the gangs of aggressive grandmothers, you know, who, who walk... Uh, down streets in Britain and and hit people with their handbags and basically pushed them off the sidewalk and uh, so there's an element of that in there. <laughs> Danny, um, just another way in which the film kind of called attention to itself in the film and is this the 
what I found a really beautiful image uh, where uh, the protagonist is in the bathroom with the monkey mask and sunglasses, and then we like see the camera in reflection of his sunglasses, which on the one hand, you know, it's nothing particularly new, but it was just so such a bizarre and beautiful image I found. Uh, but then particularly that when we see the camera, there's actually no one operating the camera, right? The camera's just running by itself. And that's also like evidently in that scene, uh, the filmmaker and the camera operator had to like leave in order for that image to work, right? So there's a moment there where he's kind of vacating his own authorial position. Um, and then the second time we see this with the shadow in the highway, he's kind of back. There is We see a silhouette of a someone at least kind of some human body like adjacent to the camera so i was just wondering if you could uh speak to those moments in the film yeah no they they are very much along this uh, sort of uh, godardian spirit of uh you know foregrounding the constructedness of film there is another scene though a third scene where you see the camera and that's at the bar when they are talking the drunk guy and the, uh, and it's the same thing as you described so well. You, you see the camera, but no one is running it. You see it from the mirror. So I guess they just turned it on and they walked away and they let the camera run. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is true. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot less didactic. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like the photorealist painter Richard Estes has uh, these the 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 coffee shop facade in in New York City where if you look at the picture closely, you start thinking, but somewhere you should see the guy who holds the camera, but he's not there, or she or it is not there, so there's no camera. And this is, this is sort of similar. I mean, with the, with, with the bar scene, they, they posi he positioned the camera in, in such a way as to make it almost disappear into the build space, but it's still there. And, and you actually, as you watch the scene, you, you go looking for it. So it's in a way it's it's a lot less didactic than Godard, let alone Wim Wenders. Uh. But it all I mean it also kind of I feel like it gives power to the actors, right? That they're kind of like there at that moment without anyone telling them what to do or force you know like instructing them to do what to do. So now it's like the actors are in control or something like they've taken over the film. I felt almost like that. There's that sense there. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't thought about it in in the way you describe it, which is the absence of the filmmaker, you know, from the scene. Uh, I mean, the filmmaker usually is absent from the scene anyway. But I, I think it is a film, and these are films in general where the performer has a lot of power. I was, and and I think this hasn't really been sort of emphasized enough. Yeah. And I, you know, yeah. I was talking earlier with Lily Bausch about it, about the incredible influence of the theater and the performance styles that were sort of current in the different sort of, you know, scenes, in the theatrical scenes of happenings, in the uh, Teatro Fizina, in the in different, you know, uh, where the body of the actor and the presence of the actor was used in a very special way, usually non-verbally, usually about more about, you know, gesturality, about, you know, throwing your body around, about sort of bumping with other bodies, or, you know what I mean? And I think there's a lot of this here. Yeah, I think, I think that's important. That is also a point that uh, Fanao Pshu Ramos was making when he was here speaking about Semes Aranya, one of the, uh, the, the Bel Air films, yeah. um, uh, which you mentioned in your talk. And, and he insisted that it was as much um, Elena Iniesta's film as it was either Gonzalez or, or Bessonis, and that actually all, all of the Bel Air films should be seen as tripartite or uh, triple authored uh, films and 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 so Maria Gladys and uh, um, Helena Inez have a lot of responsibility in that film and clearly a lot of control so I think that's a that's a very important observation to make that that they construct these scenes in a way as to leave a lot of the responsibility with with the actors with these long takes which basically just live on what the actors do yeah and John you want to go Well, let, me, let me just say something else that you said and connects with uh, what, uh, what you were saying. Is that this is true, and the camera, you know, is in, in uh, Semes Araña or Copacabana Mon Amour, the camera is for, I mean, the, the actors move, Elena Inez and Maria Gladys, they move in such a way that they force the camera, I mean, they, they, they structure the space themselves because the camera has to, like, keep going after them to capture them. So, in a way, I mean, it's uh, sort of a prolongation of what you said. You know, the actor does have a lot of power, ends up 
running the show in a way, sort of determining the structure of the scene, I think. Oh, sorry. Well, uh, I have, in fact, two questions. And as you said in your speech before the film, you um, talked about Inácio Araújo, Luiz Inácio Araújo, who is a film critic in Brazil, which I admire a lot. And I remember that he um, wrote an article at Folha de São Paulo, I guess when Tonachi died, and he said something uh, about uh, Paulo Emilio, who said in the time when, when Blah 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 was filmed, that Blah Blah Blah, 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 blah was a kind of academic film. And that Paulo Emilio was surprised with this film, Bang Bang, because it was so anarchic and uh, this audacity in the narrative and and I don't know, and I think that in Blah Blah Blah, maybe he, uh, Tonachi, Inácio Araújo said that, that maybe in Blah Blah Blah, Tonachi was more uh, worried about uh, focus, focus in form and so. And, but I, I really don't understand what he means with this academic and no academic. And I would like to know uh, if you agree with this or no. Uh, and the second question, I, I don't know if you saw um, uh, Já Visto, Jamais Visto, the last film. Ah, okay. Yeah, it, it was about this, um, the relation uh, with the, this last film from Tonacci and the rest of his career, because I think I was talking with Laura before, because I think uh, all the directors in Cinema Marginal, they are very uh, emotional and I think it's something about the, the time, also like uh, in Bang Bang, uh, it, it was an anarchic time also, and then they, bec uh, they became very emotional and nostalgic at the end. Uh, as Carlão, uh, Carlos Aixambá, uh, for example, uh, he didn't finish his last film, but he told me, uh, one month before he died, he told me he was filming uh, a film about birds for uh, his grandsons. And I found a connection about this and Já Visto, Jamais Visto, uh, Já Visto, Jamais Visto, which is a very, uh, it's a family film. And yes, uh, I would like to know what you think about it. <laughs> okay. Well, about the first one, I, I've read that comment and I couldn't understand it either, what it meant by saying that the film, that blah, 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 is academic. I mean, in a way, Tonacci is academic in these early films just because of his cinematic knowledge and because of his, um, who was it? I think it was uh, Jairo Ferreira, the, the, who I've mentioned also a lot, who says that he's uh, an extreme stylist. I mean, his style is just pristine and wonderful and whatever he does, even if there's a lot of anarchism. He's, he's the greatest visual talent in, in this group. There's no question, yeah. So I, I wonder if the academic thing is that, that he just makes incredible shots all the time. <laughs> because, you know, blah, 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 there are also kind of, um, I don't know how to put it. I mean, they're not kind of uh, uh, cutesy. They're not, they don't try to be cute. They don't try to, uh, he's not artificially pretty. I mean, it just makes perfect cinematic sense. So, but yeah, I, I don't know, like you, what he meant and why the other one would be uh, academic and this wouldn't be. I mean, to me, they seem either academic because they're just super well made or not because that doesn't really matter so much. I mean, the, what matters is something else. I mean, the style is never gratuitous. And no, I've never seen uh, Ja Visto, Jamais Visto. I wish, but I don't think it made it to Spain somehow. I haven't been able to. But yeah, no, I, no wonder they're nostalgic because, I mean, in a way, I think, uh, you know, I don't know, gosh, like how lucky to be alive through that. I mean, it was a terrible period, but it was also super creative and they did so much and they got away with so much considering the circumstances. So, I mean, I would be nostalgic too for <laughs> my 20s if I had done things like that. So, <laughs> no, but I think it's also a wonderful thing because they did this when they did it and it was had a very small circulation. A lot of these films never, bang a bang, I didn't say, but it was picked up for the quinzen, the, the realizateur at, at Cannes, so it was shown at Cannes, but not in Brazil. And a lot of these films were not shown. They were shown in very restricted, sort of, uh, in a very restricted environment, but they're, the cult, you know, their sort of their aura, I think, has grown over time, and it keeps growing. And this is an example of it. And I think the film's support, you know, the quality and the inventiveness, I think, totally supports that attention. Yeah. 
I mean, this this is a film that deserves a lot larger audience that it, that it has had so far. I would say. Um, but I think uh, it, it, to come back about to the comment about uh, blah 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 being more academic than this, I think the the second part of the the quotation that you uh, cited uh, is also important. That he says, you know, this film is a lot more anarchic and more liberated, and and I think that sort of makes sense uh, if you compare the two films. Uh, in if 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 like if we if if we agree that both films are satirical, um, blah blah blah, certainly more didactic, more you know, yeah. conventionally analytical, uh, and and yeah, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's not a it's not a performance film. Blah 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 is more based on montage. Yeah. And this one is much more. I mean, there's a lot more reliance on the improvisation of the actors, on them saying their lines kind of crazily. I think so. There's yeah. more about the actors and the contingency of performance. Performance always has an element of like not exact control. You know, anything can happen. But yeah, blah 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 is more about this very you know good actor actually delivering the speech and then yes. you know being edited with other you know relatively short cuts and very sort of well paced, well measured sort of. In, mm. I don't know speeches by others, so I don't, so yeah. I, I, in a way, I, I I guess maybe that's what it what was meant by when, you know one being more academic and the other not. Yeah. One, yeah, Tom, please. No, I think you can. Oh no, there's another question. No, no, please go ahead. Um. So I just wanted to ask uh, something else, but um, real quick, just to. Maybe we can come back to the, um, um, or we can do it later if it's uh, not, <laughs> uh, to to the role of the bathroom, um, because I found it really interesting. Uh, also, um, how scenes of the bathroom are repeatedly uh, um, used as a motive in all the films that we saw, and especially in this film. It became for me, uh, on the one hand, a, like opens this connection between a private room, a private space, and the public space, like this public toilet with um, the connection to the like hotel room, and and on the other side, like having a private bathroom and like the room in the house or uh, flat. And I was wondering if that was also like to mark this kind of tr a transition between a private space and a public space through this, um, um, yeah, how how this bathroom scenes were built up, like also maybe connected to the to a political um, dimension on the one hand, and maybe also. Um, on the way that these films um, work, like one on the one hand, the use of popular films and music, like going out, but also reflecting on the inside the system, if that maybe is also a way you could uh, read this. Okay, well, I really haven't thought so much about the bathroom in the ways you describe, but I think it's a it's a it's a, a, a possibility. I mean, I don't even know how private the bathroom is. I'm not sure. I don't know whether that's a hotel or an apartment or what it is. Um, I think that I mean, usually bathrooms in classical cinema are not something to linger over. Like, for example, I don't know, Psycho by Hitchcock created a scandal by. Uh, showing a shot of the toilet. I mean, bathrooms are something, you know, associated with bodily functions and they are to be glossed over. You know, you usually don't accompany characters into bathrooms. I mean, so I think this is here, there at the level of iconography, there is a sort of undoing of, you know, some taboos in classical film, you know, where bathrooms are sort of glossed over. I think it's an ultimately private space. And again, showing it and showing a character taking his time with his toilet or something could be a carnivalesque moment, you know, a moment of like emphasizing the body and foregrounding. Although you don't see him do anything sort of, you know, uncouth, but, you know, I mean, you do see him uh, naked and then he gets dressed and stuff. I mean, these, these are kinds of things that sort of classical films show you the final product. They don't show you, I don't know, Humphrey Bogart putting on his slips or something. So. 
Um, I mean, that's one thing that I can think about in terms yeah. of the bathroom. <laughs> Reminds me of, of John Carpenter, who uh, made a film called Dark Star, which was a satire on 2001. And he said uh, that what prompted him to make that film was that a lot of questions remained unanswered in 2001, such as where the bathroom was. And <laughs> so, um, the, but but I, I think it's interesting to, to, to raise that question and to think of these films in terms of, of the kinds of spaces that, that uh, they address and that they construct. And, um, you know, Reichenbach as a film that's almost entirely set in a small apartment uh, or in a, a you know hotel room that resembles the one in this film um, and another space that where you know you normally don't linger but that is frequent and has uh, many appearances actually in cinema marginal films is the parking structure you know you have a lot of scenes in those parking garages with these elevators which are inherently cinematic you just put your camera on there and 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 move the thing and it gets interesting right away you know <laughs> it's it's another way of getting a lot of cinema out of almost nothing but but it's it's clearly one of those spaces where you normally don't linger i mean these these are non lieu par excellence uh nondescript spaces where you, you you park your car and then you then you move out uh, they found this. Uh, this was shot in Belo Horizonte, right? Yeah. So there was a particularly beautiful one that had, you know, views of the, of the skyline in the background. Um, but but you know, it's it's interesting how the, these films linger in spaces that you would not normally uh, see in or dwell in for a long time in more conventional films. I wonder if it has to do, I mean, I'm not from Brazil, I wonder if it has to do, but you know, Spain's rhythms of modernization are not that different, I think, from perhaps Brazil. I wonder if it has to do with the fact that it's a, very, it's a relatively new structure, if these are relatively new structures and they're sort of interesting. I mean, at least, yeah, a place like Spain, parking multi-level parking garages with elevators were like exotic in, in the 60s and people will be like riding the elevator all day long you know let's get to <laughs> ride the elevators because it's so new but i don't know there's i think there's a fascination with this novelty these new architectural structures that uh, in themselves you know and and they are full of movement like you say you know this is true that they're sort of interesting uh, to I, film. I just like to add that it was a little confusion because when I watched the film, the, I, I knew it was shot in Belo Horizonte, but I still didn't recognize the city, even though it's a city that I kind of know quite well, that I've been there almost every year while I was growing up. But I uh, I also had the impression it was like, we're so used to seeing Sao Paulo as the modern city that you kind of expect that it's just shot in Sao Paulo or something. But um, it's, it, it's just this, for me, it looks like this classic, I don't know, city in modern in modernization process or with this kind of examples of, you know, what's now like kind of modern or what you can expect. Well, it, it's where Niemeyer built his first buildings. His big, first big concessions were all from uh, Kubitschek, who was the mayor of, of Belo Horizonte in the 40s and 50s. Um, yeah, but you don't see this like uh, Niemeyer or the, yeah, there's, the, the, there's like, no, the famous no, I, I kind of I mean, architecture. That's, that's what I mean. Like that's kind of, it look, almost looks like a... a I don't know. How the stand-in for stand Sao Paulo. Yeah, like it, it could be yeah. some, some other city because it doesn't show exactly these iconic buildings that one would expect as to... There's not establishing... It doesn't... I have the impression it doesn't try to show this is this one city particular. It's like, could be any city, could be any... I recognize Minas more from the part in the countryside yeah. than uh, the city. Like the city for me could be kind of any city, but the countryside is like, oh, this is Minas Gerais, you know? Like it was at least my uh, impression of the film. I don't know if any Brazilians want to comment. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the thing about uh, that's iconic about Belo Horizonte, of course, are the hills and, and, and mm -hmm. uh, the steep roads that make San Francisco look like a flatland thing. Um, but none of that is in the film either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just a quick um, follow up on the question about politics. Um, I know that in French, you can use the word regime to talk about changing gears. Um, there's something very interesting about that opening scene and then its repetition. And it's all about, I can't shift into second. And we're racing down this road 
and no turn here. And tournier, you know, to turn is to shoot a film. I mean, there's something about the way that scene puts the political question right in front of you. I mean, at least it seems. But I don't know whether that works in Portuguese, which would be important, right? Yeah, not really. Uh, it, it's very interesting, but that that doesn't really work with Portuguese in this case. Uh, but uh, it's it's an interesting reading. I mean, one could uh, oh, think of no, at least the thing with the gear, like you, know, you could think about that also in the terms of the development of the country or something, you know, like or something that that uh, I don't know it could be read. In some I mean, the whole the whole point of repetition is that they don't learn. <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't fixed the damn car. <laughs> He's still waiting at the same crossing. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah, um, yeah, no, I, I sort of agree. I'm not. I'm not sure how I would do a political reading of that scene, but I, I would have to think about it. But I see it more as you know what you mentioned about a, a sort of modernity that hasn't become quite. Um, uh, yours yet. Eh? So you drive the car, you've been driving for 15 years, but it still sticks, you know, somehow. I think it's partly about, I think everything in the film malfunctions, you know, the guy shooting never really, you know, shoots ridiculously, the conversations go nowhere, you know, you can't get the car in, sh in gear. Uh, I mean, everything is a little bit like that, you know, the the fat tranny guy starts telling a story and he's so bad that he gets a cream pie thrown at him like, <laughs> shut up, you know, the singing is horrible, you know, it's like everything is like that. So I think it's just one more thing, one more malfunction, one more disaster, small, you know, low level disaster. But, uh, but in itself, of course, that could be a, if not a political, a social comment about, you know, where are we going? What is happening? Okay. I think that's it. Thank you so much, oh, Juan. Thank you. thank you for, for staying. For, uh, <laughs> for the introduction, for the discussion. Thank you all for coming and for participating in this event and um, yeah I think we learned a few things definitely <laughs> the course of this year yes and uh, I just like to remind you all if you missed any of the lectures they're all available online on our website tropical-underground.de um, they're also on the YouTube channel of the German Film Museum and yeah I hope to see you in some uh, next event here in the Film Museum and thank you so very much uh, Juan for coming and sharing with us this film and this talk thank you very much <laughs>